treatment. Details at DennisGroup.com. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. The Boleyns changed the course of English history. Anne Boleyn's positioning herself as a woman of power on the political chessboard. If you want to climb to the king, you have to climb over other bodies. Whatever becomes of me, I'm resolved to have him. Anne and her family are a force to be reckoned with. I will strengthen my resolve. No one could have imagined a fall as graphic as the fall of the Boleyn family. The Story of the Boleyns, August 28th on NEPM. Connecting Point on NEPM is brought to you by Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield, presenting Living Ink, the Art of Tattoos, an exhibit exploring the science, art, and culture behind tattooing. More exhibits, events, and membership information at berkshiremuseum.org. Coming up, we're connecting you with the creativity and culture in your community, including an artist who creates images from dreams. And you enter in your own space and quiet. You could create whatever you want with your emotions. We're at the Berkshire Museum to explore the artistry and history of tattoos. Each canvas or each, each person is, is slightly different and as an artist you need to respond to that. And you've heard the song before, now meet the man behind it. Inch by inch, row by row. There's something about certain songs that people love to join in on and it brings us together. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture, and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Each week this summer, we're exploring all that Western New England has to offer, and today we're coming to you from the heart of the Berkshires, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, home of the Berkshire Museum. Founded in 1903 by Zenas Crane, whose family company supplies the paper that United States currency is printed on, the museum was designed to be a window on the world, with exhibits showcasing art, history, and nature. A world traveler, Crane sourced many of the first items in the museum's collection himself. Today, the museum boasts a diverse collection of more than 40,000 objects and serves its community and visitors from all over through educational, programming events, and exhibitions. We'll explore one of those exhibitions a little later in the program, but we begin our show today with a little music. Several generations of children have grown up singing the Garden Song. It's a tune that's had a long life and has been covered by several world-renowned folk singers and even performed by the Muppets. The man responsible for it, singer-songwriter David Mallet, originally wrote the song in 1975. He visited the Porter Phelps Huntington House Museum in Hadley for their Wednesday Folk Traditions concert series. And Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan brings us the story. It's been a few years since he's been back here, and generations of fans wasted no time finding what they hoped would be the best seat in the house. The he in question is folk singer and songwriter David Mallet, and the here is a sunken performance area on the Porter Phelps Huntington House Museum property in Hadley. And while these days it may appear to be some kind of storybook underground garden, it didn't always look this way. This is an old foundation of a house. Um, the, the, the whole venue, it becomes kind of like a natural amphitheater that, that was built into an old overgrown foundation of an old building. So it's just very unique, I think. The evening is part of their summer series known as Wednesday Folk Traditions, and it's been happening here for over 40 years. For some people, it's their first time here as they survey the lay of the land and figure out where they'll be sitting. Others are veterans of this venue and are thrilled to be here in time for the sound check. Whoever it is, and whatever their reason for being here, this night is indicative of the ideal summer experience for folks in this part of Hampshire County. I guess it is. Uh, Thursday nights in the commons, listening to music, going to different artists. This is Wednesday night folk music, so it's fun to do. It does sort of feel like the garden space is very nice to have music and the, and the 
hearing the music all around. Uh, it's kind of on the list of venues that we enjoy to go to in the summertime, especially now we're looking for outside places, and this hits all the good points. Those good points include viewing the show from here or here, and even from back here. I was lucky to get here early enough for these backstage seats. One thing I've noticed is there doesn't seem to be a bad seat in the house. It's an intimate setting with great music, and that's why so many people keep coming back here. And if it's intimate for the audience, then the same can be said for the performers who get to experience watching and hearing the audience sing their songs back to them as they're playing. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. It's, it's, a, it's a pat on the back, uh, a tap on the shoulder, uh, and sort of it makes it all worth it when somebody else sings your song, especially the audience, because there's something about certain songs that people love to join in on, you know? And it brings us together when we do that. And of all the sing-along songs, there is one that stands out in particular. His song that was is legendary is called The Garden Song. And it's the line is inch by inch, row by row, I'm gonna make my garden grow. You'll, you'll, I'm sure he'll play it. Inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. Sure enough, he did. Written while Mallet was still in his early 20s, the Garden Song may be responsible for helping to blow the winds of fortune in the young musician's favor, as it was recorded by such artists as John Denver, Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul and Mary, and even the Muppets. Now, after spending parts of six decades as a professional folk musician with over 15 albums to his credit, Mallet still sees a place for this genre all these years later. I think acoustic music is having sort of a rebirth right now because it's genuine and people are looking for something genuine and uh, folk music is the music of social conscience too and I think that's part of the reason we see a little bit of resurgence right now. Every week Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Legendary singer, songwriter and folk troubadour David Mallet is best known for his composition The Garden Song, but he has written many others and he draws from his vast catalog to play his song Somewhere in Time for us in this week's digital exclusive. Somewhere in time when the world stood still Said I'd always love you, now I believe I you can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. We're coming to you today from the Berkshire Museum, a window to the world where you can explore history, nature, and art. And a new exhibition here is taking a deeper look at an art form that you probably see every day. It's one that's as expressive and unique as each and every one of us are. The art of tattooing has been around for thousands of years and has had a presence in many different cultures throughout the world. The Berkshire Museum's latest exhibit entitled Living Ink, The Art of Tattoos offers an in-depth look into this art form, exploring its artistic, scientific and historical elements. I spoke with Craig Langlois, Chief Experience Officer at the Berkshire Museum, to learn more. First off, this is a homegrown exhibition. Um, we sourced uh, the artist and all of the content uh, with our staff here at the Berkshire Museum. Um, and our interest really grew from uh, the, the intersection of sort of art, science, and history, and um, the ability for tattooing to kind of tell all three of those stories at the same time. There's uh, incredible history associated with, with tattooing. Uh, the science behind it is really fascinating. And then we also wanted to really sort of focus in and highlight the art form of tattooing. It's a form that it, it's alive, right? Hence, hence the title. Uh, you're, you're tattooing a, a living thing and, and each canvas or each each person is, is slightly different and as an artist you need to respond to that and modify your design in such a way to have it be the way you want it to be before we get into the science and the history of tattooing um since it's a homegrown exhibition i really want to talk about the artists that were chosen um to be featured in here there's over 10 of them so give us a little bit of background on who they are and why you decided to pick some of them 
So the artists come um, um, as internationally recognized artists, um, some from here in uh, Massachusetts, others from as far away as uh, Copenhagen and uh, Northern London. Um, and our, our goal was really to sort of highlight the different sort of subgenres of, of tattooing, you know, who is really good at, you know, geometric patterning, who is really, really pushing the sort of subject matter, um, who is working in a way to really uh, focus on covering up um, scars or making people feel more comfortable within um, their own skin. Um, and that was sort of our, our jumping off point for for who we selected for for this exhibition. We can't talk about the present day artists without touching on the historical and cultural aspects of tattooing, which I know the exhibit touches on. So tell me how this exhibit will help broaden viewers perspective on this art form. Sure. So there's there's two main components to our um, our sort of cultural and historical background um, pieces in this exhibition. Uh, there's a great photo essay component from a uh, National Geographic photographer named Chris Rayner, uh, who spent eight years um, traveling the world and documenting uh, the use of tattooing in various cultures um, in the areas he was visiting. Uh, and then the other is um, what our staff kind of brought to the table, which was um, some really in-depth research in terms of how those cultures approach tattooing, how far back in history it kind of goes, you know, dating back almost 5,000 years and what the significance is and the various styles and, and genres that these individual cultures were using. The way the exhibition is laid out is that's kind of what you're you experience first when you walk into the space is, is you get this sort of sense of the, the global phenomenon of, of tattooing and the historical context of it. Um, and then you, as you move into the individual parlors that we set up for these contemporary artists, you can start to see the correlation between their work and that really rich history. I really, really, really loved how creative you all were when creating this exhibition. I mean, you really made it feel like you were stepping into a tattoo parlor as if you were the next client. So having this juxtaposition of the history of the art of tattooing with the present, what do we learn from that? What's something fascinating or some trends that you notice um, when creating this exhibit? I really hope that people walk away with understanding how talented tattoo artists really are. There are a few media in, in the art world that have the challenges of, of being a tattooer associated with it and really sort of highlighting the, the skill and the craft and, and the history and, and hopefully an audience member is kind of walking away understanding that relationship that when they walk into a, a tattoo parlor, you're purchasing a work of art that you're going to wear um, for, for the rest of your life. I think our design speaks to that sort of intimacy and that level of trust as you kind of walk into those individual parlors and, and kind of move around. But the other, the other sort of um, interesting piece that we kind of wove into this is that um, we wanted to have a sense of interactivity as well. We didn't want the viewer just to be, um, you know, looking at this fantastic work um, from these artists, but also sort of responding to it um, in a way um, where we have areas where they can answer questions about, you know, why did they get a tattoo? Or if they were to get a tattoo, um, what would it be about? Or to even try your hand a little bit at understanding the, the subtle nuances of how to tattoo with some fake skin and some markers so you can attempt to draw on something that is realistic of flesh material. We know that tattoos can be taboo for some, celebrated by others, but regardless, what do you hope um, that viewers and visitors really leave and take away after viewing this special exhibit at the Berkshire Museum? I think part of our goal was definitely to kind of remove the, the taboo um, and understand that um, beyond uh, whether or not you personally want a tattoo or, or have a tattoo is that um, there is a, a deep cultural significance um, to uh, a lot of tattoos um, around the world um, and, and how they're viewed in, in various cultures, um, as well as really sort of highlighting the, the art form. I'll, I'll say it again, like um, the, these tattooers, what they can do with a, a, a moving instrument um, that's, you know, um, oscillating at an extremely high speed uh, and pressing into to, um, a three-dimensional form uh, to create an image that looks right, both when you're looking at it from six inches away or, you know, four feet away is, is a phenomenal skill. And regardless if you think tattoos are taboo or, you know, an accepted form of, of self-expression, really, we should be celebrating these artists and, and the art form as something on the same level as traditional painting or, or sculpture. Maricela Obando Moya arrived in the United States from her native Costa Rica on September 7, 2015, knowing very little English. Four years and a lot of hard work later, and she not only learned the language, but had also become a U.S. citizen as well, living in Greenfield. 
Her lifelong passion is her artwork, and she began her professional career at the age of 16. Having studied art making in her homeland, she expresses herself through painting with a particular love for creating murals. Producer Dave Frazier shares her story. Creating art has always been a big part of Maricela Obando Moya's life. It's so peaceful. It's like a, uh, you disconnected yourself with the, this real world and you enter in your own space and quiet. You can create whatever you want with your emotions. Moya was born and raised in Cartago, a mountain city in Costa Rica. Her childhood was difficult, living with an alcoholic mother and an absent father. But she discovered art at an early age when her kindergarten teacher introduced her to painting. When I was a child, I remember um, to me it was a difficult life. And to me, um, get, uh, make friends was the stones and the river. You know, the huge stones, I paint faces, and I call them my friends. Many of her paintings come from her imagination, memories of her homeland as well as people's dreams, bringing back into the world moments that they thought were vanished forever. One night, I had a dream. It was beautiful. That morning, I woke up. I said, you know what? My artwork, I am going to paint my dreams and energies that I can perceive in Mother Nature and people as well. And boom, I did it all in my, in my canvas. Every time that I can hear somebody with a dream, say, can I paint your dream? Moya left Costa Rica when she was in her 30s and moved to Western Mass with her family. Knowing only hi, how are you, and thank you, she began to learn English at the Center for New Americans in Northampton. When you are learning a language, it's like a it's try to survive. Because you are in a country when you need to find a job, try to communicate your, yourself with others, and doing something, you know. And my 38 years old, you know, a adult woman, <laughs> try to learn like a baby, become again, and growing every year, you know, with this uh, new language. As a way of showing her appreciation for all the Center for New Americans did for her, Moya decided to paint a mural in the stairway outside of the CNA's office. The center had won a $1,000 grant from the Northampton branch of the Awesome Foundation to fund the mural. I put my mind in that place, in that mural. Hmm. I remember this lady. I remember this guy. Oh, this one, you know? And it's become, and the whole world, I paint him because uh, we are one with the same energy. Moya's Greenfield home is full of art, murals, and furniture she has found on the side of the road and painted, transforming those pieces into works of art. Her living room is her studio, where she paints and gets inspiration. Before I just start, I started here. Just, I take colors and it's coming like a, like a magic. It's like a boom. I need this brush, I need this painting, and just I to start to do that. I never think uh, I did a mistake because in life there is no mistakes. We are learning from them. And always, you know, like a, through painting around, it's like, a, uh, I like this light here, maybe it means something there. Oh yeah, I can create this. It's my dreams there, it's my energy, it's my love, it's my passion. After a 31-year run, the Co-Festival of Performance in Amherst announced that this season of productions would be its final one. But before the curtain closed for the last time, the festival presented two performances and a story slam that all fit the appropriately titled theme, which was Stepping Up, Stepping Back. I spoke with co-creators of the productions as well as the artistic director at the Co-Festival of Performance to hear more about this farewell season and how the organization is reimagining its future. The real catalyst, I think, was attending the TCG conference 
online last year, which is the Theater Communications Group Conference. And I have been doing a lot of online um, anti-racism trainings, particularly in theater circles. And um, one of the things um, that I heard loud and clear was um, uh, a need to make space. Um, which is exactly the theme of the show that Linda Paris Bailey, who's joining us today, is working on with Eric Bath as well. There's something about stepping up by stepping back. Um, that is our season theme this year. And so speaking of the theme, stepping up, stepping back, um, the final productions that are featured in the season really fit well into that theme. And so Linda, I'll move on to you. Um, you are the opening act of the final season of Co-Festival with your production entitled Flushing, Make Room for Someone Else. And it's a story told by puppets um, that really touches on the fact that with time comes change. Um, so share with me about the message that you really want audience to take away from this production. Well, I think when you've led an organization for as long, um, as any of us on, on this panel have, um, there comes a time when you know that there needs to be a transition. There needs to be um, a change in, in leadership, uh, maybe a change in direction. Um, so as we are considering, or as I have done, stepping down from these organizations, you have many, many questions about what's next. I mean, we are not going to stop being artists. And uh, so where is our future? Where, where are we going? And I think the piece Flushing uh, really delves into that. It delves into that question with puppets and song and uh, live actors. So it's kind of a, a composite piece of uh, different genres and different stories. So we're looking at all of the questions that surround that. Uh, I have heard from many, many, many of uh, my friends, artists, who are in that same transition moment and um, are looking forward to what we have to say about it. Linda, you and I were talking before the interview started about transition and how everybody it doesn't matter what age you you are, you go through a transition. So talk about how important transformation is, I mean, in the creative arts, really in life in general. What what comes from these types of moments? Well, I, I think if you look at drama in general, uh, our most dramatic moments are when we are in transition. It's where I think you, you find your greatest creativity. Um, it becomes very personal and it becomes also very universal. So uh, delving into those moments. And along with the theme, we move on to the closing production, um, which Bob, you're leading. It's titled Ezel, Ballad of Land Man. So this explores the complexity of climate change, indigenous erasure, environmental extraction. What led to the creation of this um, production for you? Well, many roads led to the creation of this. One, one of the stories that comes up immediately is when uh, the land, the landman is, um, uh, you know, another word for a land rights speculator, someone who would purchase the land rights to land that you are living on, that you may own the deed for, and then do uh, something with those land rights in, in where we live in the foothills of, of eastern Kentucky. You know, we've been coal country for the last 150, almost 200 years, and, 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 extractive resource industry has really buoyed the economy all throughout our region. Um, and so in that vein, there's been this transition as coal has declined towards natural gas and oil through fracking. And just a few years ago, we had a landman come to our house, you know, unannounced where we live. You know, it's like, it's at least polite to like honk your horn to say you're there. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but this person drove their dually pickup truck like right up to the porch strode onto the porch confidently, you know, uh, spoke to my partner, Carrie Brunk, who's a co-producer and, and performer in this work by name, called me by name, had done a Google search of who we were. It was affronting and off-putting, and it was designed to assert a type of knowing or dominance. And we started thinking about how we've all had to practice forms of domination. We've been taught that. We've been enculturated to, to practice dominance over each other, over self in our community, to try to get ahead. And what happens to the spirit when you practice that form of domination over yourself, over others, over the land? What gets released? And in this story, Ezel, Ballad of a Landman, 
you see the journey of someone who has been in uh, Iraq, who has like, you know, scrapped metal, who has done whatever they can to try to make a living and never gotten a foothold. And that all of those modes of trying to make a living has outstripped this person's uh, family and their existence. And now due to the fracking boom in their area, the, the land company is offering them the chance to use their privilege as a white man in the country who kind of knows these people to say, you know what, let me buy your land rights. Nothing will probably come of it. But in our neck of the woods, if 50% of your people sell their land rights, then uh, due to uh, uh, something called forced pooling, everyone is compelled to participate, whether or not you sign a lease. And so it's what, what happens to this dream of trying to find right livelihood when you're practicing domination on self and on others and what gets released and how are you fracking your spirit as you as you move into this this land this this world so sabrina this final season has been packaged beautifully with these two productions that intersect and really deliver the message that you want about stepping up and stepping back um with this final season reflecting on change resilience transformation sabrina what are you most proud of and what are you looking forward to the most as well? I think I'm most proud of um, valuing a, a metric that isn't how big, how many, how much, but it's how sticky can we make the experience for all the people who are involved with Co. How long can we make that experience and that time resonate and stick with people and make people go, huh? And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. Our thanks to the Berkshire Museum for hosting us today. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and take care. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. All it takes is a rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground. Inch by inch and row by row, someone bless these seeds I sow. Connecting Point on NEPM is brought to you by Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield, presenting Art of the Hills, Visual Evidence, a juried art exhibition celebrating the creative culture of the region, highlighting the works of both emerging and established Berkshire-based artists. More information at berkshiremuseum.org. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's crackdown on women, undercover, correspondent Ramita Navai finds those who have been punished by the regime and the defiant voices fighting back. These women say they're risking their lives just by being here. Afghanistan Undercover, Tuesday night at 10 on NEPM. Meet Zimbabwe's breakout presidential candidate. On the eve of election day, the incumbent seizes control of the vote. A sobering account proving the fight for democracy never ends. President on POV. Watch President Monday night at 9 on NEPM. I am Mohammed and this is my wife Alia. We have four kids under the age of six. They're American, but they haven't seen their life represented on TV. On Let's Go Luna, one of the characters had a scarf and that shows them that they're included, that they're connected, and that helps my kids so much. PBS Kids is a partner to parents. They are focused on how to raise kids the right way, to look at the world as one. Ali Ho!
Nature Cat estará en los museos de Springfield para los días de NEPM, del 2 al 11 de agosto, martes y jueves de 11 de la mañana hasta las 2 de la tarde. Miembros de NEPM reciben un descuento en la entrada y es gratis para los residentes de Springfield. Los niños pueden plantar un jardín o explorar una cueva en la exhibición Backyard and Beyond. Para más información visite NEPM.org. Put your head on my shoulder oh, in America Sugar pop, honey, 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 honey. Doo Pop and Soul Generations, August 13th on NEPM You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield The Bullins changed the course of English history. Anne Bullins positioning herself as a woman of power on the political chessboard. If you want to climb to the king, you have to climb over other bodies. Whatever becomes of me, I'm resolved to have him. Anne and her family are a force to be reckoned with. I will strengthen my resolve. No one could have imagined a fall as graphic as the fall of the Bullin family. The Story of the Bolins, August 28th 